Hi, guys. Jim Vanosky with Manufacturing Talks. You know, it was way back in the 1990s that I think pretty much all of American textile making went overseas. In fact, even today, only like 3% of what we make is made here in the U.S. But there was a cotton farmer named Mark Yeager down in Alabama who wanted to do a little bit more. And back in 2015, when his daughter was able to join the business with him, he formed a company called Redland Cotton, started out making bed sheets, and he's expanded from there. And Anna and Mark are here today to tell us how you can successfully make textiles in America here on Manufacturing Talks. Stay tuned. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. EYS Media, your digital media relations agency. Public relations, website design, digital marketing. You get found by the customers and talent who need your solutions. You get media placements and top publications, the best job candidates coming to your website, a digital presence that gets you found by the right people. Call 616-298-8798 to get started today. I'm Jim Vanosky with Manufacturing Talks. Thanks once again to our sponsor, DYS Media. And I'm very happy to be joined today by Anna Brakefield and her dad, Mark Yeager. They are co-owners at Redland Cotton down in Alabama. Welcome, you two. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Good to be here. Oh, good to have you here. This one's a great story. So I wrote about Redland in Forbes, uh, what, two, three months ago, and just thought it was a, a, a great one for the show here because you guys have such a, a wonderful story. Uh, everyone out here in my audience is interested in American manufacturing, so I know you're all about that. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to hearing all about it. But before I launch into all of the history of Redland, I would want to hear just how you two got where you are. And ordinarily, I'd go, you know, ladies first. But in this case, Mark, since you have the longer history, uh, I'm going to start with you, if that's okay. Well, I as 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 far as uh, you know, I, I went to college, uh, but I did not finish. I uh, dropped out. My dad had a successful business after World War II. He uh, he got to work in electronics in the Navy and he started a business. So it, he had a business in Huntsville, but he invested in land. And uh, out of uh, six kids, I was the only one who really wanted to farm. So uh, I started farming in 1982 uh, and uh, have been farming ever since. And uh, I got into growing cotton right off the bat and found it was a very uh, fulfilling thing for me to do. He, my dad had grown up on a very small cotton farm in uh, Southern Tennessee, maybe 60 miles from where we are now. And, and uh, he kind of had a love for it. So he enjoyed until the, he, he couldn't anymore to, he enjoyed being around it. So, uh, uh, but I, I built a cotton gin in 94 was, uh, one of the landmark things I can think of and where we were able to gin our own cotton. And, uh, my acres have grown over the years and we're up to, I don't know, probably 55, 5,600 acres of total crop. We rotate with corn and, uh, that's about where I got to now. As far as Redland Cotton goes, I had this idea in 2015 to take our cotton and make a product. And I'll be honest with you, uh, it sounds pretty simple, but I thought sheets would use the most cotton. <laughs> so <laughs> it, uh, we have learned a tremendous amount since then. And uh, here we are now. So I'll, uh, I'll stop right there and let Anna catch up. Okay. Uh, I, and my background is a lot more succinct as I've had less life to live, but um, I went to Auburn University and got a degree in graphic design. I moved to New York and worked in advertising there for a couple of years, then moved to Nashville. My husband and I got married. I was working in advertising and not, not feeling uh, fulfilled. And that's when... Dad and I started Redland Cotton. So 
um, much more succinct. Yeah. And, and so that was one interesting point is how it all just kind of came together with your background uh, coming out of the business world and, and your education and then tying it in with obviously uh, Mark, your long history in growing cotton and ginning cotton and having that inspiration to make sheets. Now you jumped ahead on one of my questions and answered why you started with sheets, but tell me a little bit more about just the inspiration for doing textiles. I mean, that's obviously, you know, you look across America and that's something where almost the whole business fled overseas way back in the nineties. And here you are in 2015 saying, yeah, I think I'm going to make textiles. <laughs> what, what inspired that? Well, I, I, I guess I'll start out. I mean, they, you know, growing the cotton and, and understanding the value of the longer staple and the fineness of the cotton and, thinking about what we could do with what we w were growing. You know, I, I mean, I, I guess I thought about whiskey a little bit with my corn. I've thought about a lot of different things, you know, that uh, just trying to get vertical and, and figuring out a way to keep more of that money in my pocket. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious when you go buy, buy a pair of Wranglers that weigh about a pound and you give $40 for them, there's a long way from the farmer who grew that. <laughs> right. Yep. So, uh, I guess uh, that was kind of the inspiration. But the sheets intrigued me. I thought they. I thought it was something we could do. And I had. I had read a blog in the the Washington. I mean, not Washington. Uh, Chicago. What is it? Chicago Tribune or whatever. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, this had been several years before, and th there were a bunch of ladies talking about. They could not find the 100% cotton per cow sheets of yesteryear. And mm -hmm. they had a whole blog, and it was going back and forth. And uh, I found that to be interesting. And uh, and anyway, I'll let Anna take it from there. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, as he said earlier, the I think the true thought was how much – what is a good that we could make that would use the most cotton and mm – -hmm. Obviously, a, a wide good would use a, a ton of cotton, and that did become, we found out, one of the more difficult things to manufacture in the United States, as mm. a lot of that wide good manufacturing has gone overseas. Um, and that's not to say that the apparel side hasn't gone over as well. But as we've kind of dipped our toe into apparel manufacturing over the last two years, um, I know that we have found it to be considerably easier um, than what we experienced. And that may just be because we're better at it now. Yeah, um, yep. But, but it, it, manufacturing a wide good, there are very few resources left. Um, so that initial startup in, in 2015 required a lot of a lot of legwork to put together that initial supply chain just because the options were not great. Mm -hmm. there's there's more knitting in the united states than there is weaving left so the knitters are probably winning although very poorly compared to asia but uh, uh there there is more knitting so um uh, like the t-shirts or polo shirts and stuff like that weaving especially wide weaving uh, the best i can tell is some of the automotive Claws uh, industry is that's that's thriving somewhat in the Carolinas. So yeah, uh, and 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 even some of the manufacturers we've started to work with to kind of rebuild a cotton program in their warehouses, they have made names for themselves as primarily polyester mm -hmm. um, or a cotton poly house, and have kind of moved away from cotton. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it, you see it, it's not a secret that a lot of cotton manufacturing goes to China and India right. where that labor is super cheap. Yep. Um, and that just. Jim, sort of uh, cotton has never brought what it should bring. Somebody has always got screwed by cotton. Mm. I'm sure Pharaoh screwed the Egyptians that were working. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. I mean, the slavery, the, the, oh, yeah. There is no way that Target can sell 
a nice per cal set of cotton sheets for 30 something dollars. I mean, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, are the, is the Chinese government subsidizing it? Are they using forced labor? It's not much better out of India. Mm-hmm. And it's not the price of the, the, the world price of cotton is pretty stable. So it, it, I don't know. I don't know how it, how it can be some of the, what we see uh, in big box stores selling right. stuff for nothing. One thing, their quality is nothing like ours, right. but it's still, I don't, you, you can't imagine even how you can ship it over here for what the price is. Yeah. So it's crazy. Well, but we know that there are, are those kinds of subsidies going on. And, and that is part of what's um, stripped away some of our manufacturing capabilities. So it's unfortunate and that that's reality, but you know, what I love about you guys is you found this niche where you're this premium quality product, you're offering something that people can't find. And so you've gotten us back into it, but you know, you talk about that difficulty in finding someone out of the gates to make this stuff for you. Has that gotten any easier as time's gone, gone on just with the sheets themselves, or is that still a struggle? I would say that it's gotten easier as as we've grown our minimums and been able to to reach out to larger vendors, I think it has gotten somewhat easier. Um, but the options are still slim. Mm-hmm. And we we went through an exploration earlier this year on just trying to make a different kind of fabric than than what we're currently making now to diversify and uh, maybe fill another need in the market. And really our, our options are quite limited um, from spinning all the way to, to weaving and and, finishing and finishing. I mean, it's just, and that's not to say that as we continue to grow, that we couldn't make it work um, later on, but it is just kind of limited. It'll I, it'll take big quantities yeah. to get a, get a manufacturer to tool up to do that. And you know we're doing relatively big quantities from where we started, but we're we're nowhere near ready for a plant to go in and tool up to change that drastically. Yeah, because the the truth is, most of these plants that are still around in the United States are family owned. Um, they're not public and that, that capital to put in a new machine or to train the new employees to do any of these new things that would, they would have to look at a program that they thought was going to exist for quite some time for them to put in those resources. And Mm -hmm. I mean, we totally understand that. Um, but it, it, I know we wish we could do more. Well, it is an interesting point though. I, you know, out in industry in general, everyone's talking up automation and, um, you know, industry 4.0 and all, all this glittering technology, but that's not the reality for these smaller producers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, the only thing that's going to change that is people making the choice to, invest locally yeah well and and, you know you made it work by going up market are there other people you talk to who see that opportunity in other products where you might affiliate with you know not necessarily competitors on what you're doing but people who would use those same um vendors those same manufacturers where you might pull your efforts together and and make it a bigger overall business there are uh, some guys I haven't met them like Southern Draw. I I they're doing an, an American product, but I'm not sure. I'm not really. I don't think they're doing a whole lot. That it's a it's a it's a pretty big commitment to advertise to get. I mean, I can't believe what we spend on advertise, but I mean, yeah. it brings in results. I mean, we're on Fox News every day, and. Uh, Anna's retargeting and Google and Facebook stuff's about equal money. I mean, it's it's a it's expensive thing to get 
to where we've gotten uh, at the quantity we are at. So I, I, don't, I don't know of a whole lot of people who are trying to do what we're doing. No, and just the the current climate of things from what I can tell, even from the the bigger players that at least spin their yarn here, even if it's taken to Mexico to be made or mm-hmm. or whatever, if they're doing any domestic work here, um, you know, forecast for consumer demand is down. Um, the people aren't placing new orders right now. Mm-hmm. Um, by and large. So, I, I, well, unfortunately, I think we're going to need um, some of the economy to come back um, to get any sort of momentum going back again. When well, you're talking about the plants, uh, your your sales are actually up forty yeah, percent. Yeah, no, but I mean, but yeah, I mean, just your overall question was like, could multiple companies pull together? Um, efforts. And to your point, I think that we've carved out a niche here for ourselves. And that fortunately is is still going really well for us. Um, You know, our, our growth is, is still great, but unfortunately that is not the case for a lot of retailers um, right now. Yeah. Got it. Now, um, Anna, you mentioned earlier that you'd gone into, um, apparel so you've expanded your product line some is that uh, another uh, option for you to to grow the business something that you're looking at even further yeah and I, my my basic thought on that is i know that my my generation whatever you want to say about it um is more inclined to purchase a wearable than they are um necessarily investing in a home. I know that, mm. uh, uh, you know, a larger majority of us rent, um, mm. not necessarily investing in that American dream. That's not my uh, experience, but I think it is a way for us to reach out to a younger audience mm-hmm. with some, some wearable goods that are at a lower price point um, and that we can more easily manufacture and, and hit these like seasonal uh, things right. uh, that that kind of give give us more talking points to be more relevant in the press, et cetera. So that that is my thought in apparel, and it just so happens it seems to be a lot easier. Um, <laughs> yep. Gives us more flexibility, and it's a lower price point for us, and a lower price point for the the customer. Are there? Are there a lot more opportunities as far as other things to make in that easier realm that you know you can look at down the road? I think so. I think and you know, I think we are still hopeful that there's more to experiment with in the wide goods. Um, but definitely the smaller the item, there seems to be more options there. Um, but that initial bottleneck is the, the spinning and what they're willing to do and their minimums and, mm-hmm. and that. Well, really the only a pair, well, we, we make a, uh, the go anywhere shirt is what it is online, but it's kind of a spinoff from the fabric that we were already making. So we kind of piggybacked in on sheet fabric with that, that shirt. And, you know, if we've so far, we re- the, I guess the biggest stick in your toe in the water is the, the, uh, uh, all the loungewear that we introduced last year, which was a knit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I don't know. It, it's going to be interesting. We really don't, we really don't have a lot of, uh, experience with it so far, the apparel part. So, mm-hmm. well, you say that that's just the stuff that's come to market, but the, the stuff that we're working on bringing to our customer this year is a new uh, kind of rest shirt, work shirt, um, mm-hmm. apparel. There's a t shirt, there's more um, knitted loungewear coming and other more pajama related mm-hmm. items. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as like 
finishing the fabric differently, different prints, different colors, that is much more easily achieved in a narrow woven or a narrow knit mm-hmm. um, than than what we than what we can do in sheeting, unfortunately. Right. Yep. Have there been any other big challenges that you've had to overcome beyond that difficulty in finding the people to make your stuff? And obviously, you know, you've got tough competition from a price perspective, but um, anything else that was a surprise to you as you got into it and had to work through? I really think the biggest difficulty that we're facing right now is, is labor and the quality of labor Mm -hmm. and the, the willingness to work. Um, that that seems to be present not only in our own cut and sew uh, manufacturing facility in Mississippi, but it's it's across the board with all of our vendors. Um, it 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 just seems to be a persistent problem. Um, I I think I think that has been the biggest challenge once we overcame the the COVID issues with just the plants closing, it was then filling the plants up with people. Um, so. Well, it, it's traditionally probably been a, a lower pay scale working in textile mills than it has been as far as the plants go that are having trouble finding operators to run looms or spinning machines. I, I think it's probably around a $20 an hour deal and which is not terrible, but let's face it, our government has uh, encouraged those jobs to, to not, be, you, you might as well stay at home. But Right, yeah. yeah. You look at the workforce participation numbers and they've never recovered to pre-COVID levels and those weren't that great. It's been falling. I, I tell you, Jim, it's a, it's a shame. Some of these small towns where our cut and sew is and, and our little town here, I mean, we got a new gas station. That's the first thing that's gone in a long time, but uh, it's a drug culture that, that doesn't, I mean, it's, I hate to get too negative on this. <laughs> well, it's reality though. It's not, it's not just you dealing with it either. Um, yeah. It's all over the country. And, and frankly, I was surprised recently I did a, article on mining and I talked to a gentleman in South Africa and a gentleman in Cyprus and both of them talked about the labor challenge. So it's not just here either. Yeah. It's amazing. Those heartbeats are out there and they're just don't want to work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And even if you get them in the door, you know, they don't stay. Um, They don't show up. It's it's, every other day. It's difficult. Definitely. Yeah, I hear you. Um, When you look at driving that continued growth, are there other avenues, um, partnerships, uh, other outlets, things that you that you're thinking of? Yeah, um, a great example of that would be a collaboration that we just launched with Banana Republic. Um, Nice. Yep. Yeah. It. She's really done a great job on that, Jim. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I, I think it is proof positive and in, in, in the numbers that they're giving us and how it's being received also that the customer is looking for an American-made product mm-hmm. and um, that they're willing to purchase at that price point and that a small a smaller brand like Redland Cotton can um, work and partner with a a bigger guy. And what I am so encouraged by is how they're signaling to us that it, I'll just, I'll go back a little bit. It was mm-hmm. very difficult for me as, I mean, my team's pretty small. Um, jumping through all the hoops that needed to be jumped through to, um, get our plant up to speed um, with all the regulations that Gap and Banana Republic require. Yep. Um, all of their testing regulations, all of their um, <laughs> social governance and all of these other things. Um, but I think it was very much worth it um, to, to put our name out there with a brand that has been around for so long. Um, so I think that that is a great way 
to to grow the brand and and grow our presence and lend some legitimacy to what we're doing. And I, I'm, like I said, very encouraged that bigger companies are are looking in the mirror a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, it, it was it was it wasn't funny, haha, but it was a little ironic to me. They were struggling so hard to meet this launch because they were not getting their product in from overseas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We beat everybody else, Jim. <laughs> I don't, I don't know a... if we beat everybody else because we had our challenges <laughs> as well, for sure. Yep. Um, but it, it was, it's so encouraging for me to hear them say, you know, we're looking down the road and seeing that we need to prioritize our American vendors. Yep. And that means that we have to change some of our policies and some of just the way that we even communicate because all of their business team was in Hong Kong. So all of my communications with them was at least 24 hours delayed, Mm -hmm. um, which really, I mean, that was a pain point, Mm -hmm. just communication. Um, I couldn't stand those conversations. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But I think, I think that is a great example. Um, so, I mean, bigger collaborations, smaller collaborations. We're doing a collaboration with um, these pattern makers out of Georgia um, and just kind of getting out there and mixing and mingling with different people and getting our name out there that way. Right. Yeah. Well, and I love what you, what you said about you getting product to people when their overseas suppliers couldn't do it. And and that's another thing, another thing I hear. Uh, kind of across the board is those difficulties in supply chain have really got uh, domestic retailers rethinking where they're getting stuff. So it's a tremendous opportunity. For sure. We've had some, we've had some good luck to uh, Brian kill made with Fox news mm-hmm. interviewed us and got us to come up and be on TV. And uh, I befriended him at a event I was in, in Miami last fall and uh, Dagan McDowell on uh Fox Business mm-hmm. has just took it upon herself several times to talk about Redland Cotton on Maria Bartiromo show. And mm-hmm. I don't know, we've had some lucky breaks. We've we tried very hard, but we've had some nice things happen too. Well, good. You deserve it. <laughs> uh, and, and along those lines, we're we're getting close to the end of time. And I have one final question, and that is um, you know, you've gone through the the difficulties and the opportunities and the 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 places where you were lucky. What's your message to other people who might be thinking about jumping into the American manufacturing realm for themselves? I would suggest that they at least try it and source their options because I do think that there is a there is a message out there that resonates with people, and even though it may cost more and it may be a bigger burden to you to get started. Mm-hmm. I think it's worth it. And I think it's appreciated. So that that's what I would suggest to people. Well, I would say work with what's here and I don't know what product is you want to make and see what's left of that industry and, right. uh, and, and build those relations with those plants. I mean, we, we had a, phone call this morning with Millican, which is a pretty big textile plant mm-hmm. here in the United States. I guess probably the biggest. And, uh, you know, they, we've been working with them now for two or three years and it's, uh, it just takes a while to get in and, and build that relationship. And, mm-hmm. uh, I guess if I look back at, we, uh, I would, uh, one thing I would say, and I always tell it, I told, uh, Cotton Incorporated that, we needed to find a retired Methodist from uh, uh, in the textile industry, to, to an old engineer to help us. And that's what we found, but he wasn't a Methodist. So anyway. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's a good point to try to find a retired or somebody who's been in the game for a while mm-hmm. to kind of help yep. you learn the ropes. Yeah. And that expertise. Yeah. Because even, I mean, dad knew a heck of a lot more about textiles than I did when we started, but 
even he needed to be shown around spinning, weaving and finishing. Um, There's a lot of knowledge in, in a little gray hair that's retired from some of these businesses sure. that uh, can really help you out. Well, and you've partnered with a university too, right? If I recall correctly. Well, no, not really. We we used Cotton Incorporated, which is the research promotion arm. That's of what cotton. I'm thinking of. Yep. So yeah, there's expertise out there, and you just have to go out and find it, right? <laughs> exactly. And yep. uh, we found a cracker jack. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Anything else to share before we wrap up? No, I mean, I know that there's been like, there, there are definitely challenges, but overall, I really think it's positive. And I think if there are more people telling positive stories, then more people can be encouraged to continue to put their investments in American manufacturing. There, there is a lot of people in the United States who want it to go back to America first. Mm -hmm. And even a lot of them on both sides of the aisle, even. I mean, uh, it's it's important to a lot of people, and I think it's important for the existence of our country. So I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping it becomes more and more important. Well, I agree, and I wish you both all the best for continued growth and success. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be checking back in with you to make sure things are progressing. So for now, thanks so much for joining us on Manufacturing Talks. Anna, Mark, it was a, a real treat having you here. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jim. Yep. And thank all you for tuning in. Tune in every Tuesday for new episodes. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vanosky. Watch for new episodes dropping every Tuesday. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe.